Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to part four of my critique of ukulele. We have been comfortably sailing through pretty much all of the mechanics of this game with some tidbits here and there to really see what's been happening when they are tested in the field. And so next, let's tackle something simplistic yet important. Combat in the game is very much subdued in that it isn't something to concern yourself with as much as other mechanics. However, it does get a bit of criticism here and there, so let's cover it real quick. Combat from Ukulele's perspective will mostly amount to, at the very most, a triple basic attack and some jump attacks thrown in. On top of this, you can use unlocked moves to cause damage here and there. What is neat is that the combat never really breaks the flow. You will essentially float over the ground as you use basic attacks, while knocking enemies out of the way. In this sense, when you are traveling from one area to another and you have a handful of enemies in the way, you can find yourself knocking them out of the way as long as you hit the right buttons at the right time, very much a rhythm game mechanic in its own right. As I said, there is a triple attack. It would seem that as long as you nail an enemy on the first and second hits, you'll be able to see the full animation. This is completely unnecessary, but it's appreciated regardless. Though whenever you pick up something for the slurp shot, it does remove your basic attacks in favor of the shot itself, which I found a little annoying at some times. Why not both game? Can't you bind it to other stuff? Now onto the ones you'll be using this combat on the most. Corplets. Corplets don't always behave that aggressively. You'll find that they will act as a minor roadblock to mix up the different paths taken between set pieces. They take up the main chunk of enemies in the game, while the other enemies in the game are far more challenging to defeat by comparison. But honestly, I think how almost useless the corplets are is on purpose, since cranking their aggression is probably pretty easy. Though it does seem as though these enemies just lose any sense of direction randomly, and fighting them isn't any kind of challenge. Also, the corplets have no idea how to act against you when you're elevated. It's kind of pathetic, but I guess that fits how useless they are? Like most games give the basic enemies some kind of basic ranged attack, like throwing poop or whatever, but not here. Also, if you stay elevated, they start to very creepily just slide backwards away from you, and then charge at you, only to repeat the same process. I don't think the devs know about this shit, or if they do, it's a very strange choice. Overall, though, a very decent basic enemy with five variations, as we have mentioned before. Next up is the bee drones, which are about as mobile as corplets, only they are often protected by a ring of spikes, or several rings, kind of. You must wait before attacking them if you wish to use your basic attacks. If you stun them first, it's an easy kill. These things are rather aggressive, but they still only take one hit to kill. And an interesting interaction is that they actually have some friendly fire. Next up are the googly eyes, which have stirred up some controversy on their lonesome. It would seem that people either feel that the fact that they animate and convert inanimate objects into enemies is interesting and meta, or lazy and boring. Well, the facts are that they require one hit to kill, but only if they are alone. If they assume the body of some unwitting object, then it acts as additional health. Killing them can be frustrating when you factor in that you need to wait for the opportunity to strike, since if the body is spinning, it'll hurt you, rather than hurt them. Once you knock out the body, just knock out the eyes, and they're finished. Lastly for the basic enemies is the Corplet Punisher strong guys, who are happily equipped with what is essentially super health and super attacks in that they cannot be interrupted. I think it takes eight basic attacks to kill these guys. They work as a beefier enemy, though I just find the fact that they move so smoothly a bit odd. When they attack, it almost looks as if they're being dragged as an image across the floor. In the end, though, they make for a decent threat. Overall, there are plenty of ways to dispatch these enemies. Basic attacks, sonar shots, jumping attacks, slurp shots, transformations, buddy slams, sonar shield, etc. And once you actually figure out their tells and how your tools work, they become actual fights. I think people have a complete misconception about the combat in this game. Not only does it work, it works very well for the genre. The combat does not stand in your way, most of the time it is skippable, but you will get the reward of clearing the area for peaceful exploration, and more than likely some hit points will be returned. When I was first approaching the game, I did indeed find the combat a tad distracting in that I would attack randomly, just failing and hoping and getting very useless results, immediately blaming the game, but then I noticed the tells in the enemies and started experimenting. Ultimately, the combat is a lot more realized than it may seem, and what people are claiming it is, a crappy system that you simply tap one button, would be wrong. Right now you're seeing a selection of fights that were actually engaging and rewarding based on using what I knew. Now lastly for mechanics, even though there will be some form of returning to it in the future of this series, the tutorial, or as I lovingly called it in my standalone video, Guidance, definitely has its own style in this game, and just how well does it do? Every item you collect in this game has its own explanation, including but not limited to the Satanic Heart Extender. Upon discovery, the game will shoot an explanation for the quills and butterflies located right at the beginning of the game, as well as the alternative method of butterfly intake. Next up is the explanation of a tome and ghostwriters and expansions and heart extenders and power extenders and, and wow. Check out this one all the way at the middle of the final world. A little explanation for a move we've been using for a while. 
Hmm. This is a very quick version of the kind of guidance you can expect from this game as a whole. Basically deadpan explanations of what a thing does and how they will persist long after you feel you have sufficiently learned it. Though let's explore that a little first, shall we? The tutorial consists of straightforward descriptions for what you're supposed to do. I have no issue with this, though it would be preferable to skip more parts of it, I suppose. During the most tutorially tutorial section, though, the game even comments on how it is a classic tutorial done in a very standard way, which essentially implies perhaps that it is boring or simple. I can't say, but the section itself is extremely cookie cutter. Learn to duck, swim, fight, and move on. Not bad, not good. I feel like referencing the fact that you don't have something innovative in a tutorial, or at least outside the box, is a little bit of a cop-out, especially since Banjo-Kazooie's tutorial was slightly contrived, sure, but it gave you incentive to complete the lessons because you would get a piece of life extension for each part. While here, it's a little bit more simplistic. There is a minor issue in that when you approach Ivory Towers, a handful of players, including myself, didn't understand what was needed to be done. We assumed that the front door is locked and you have to find an alternative route, especially after the cutscene with Quack turning you away. Just a small note in the strange attention to direction here. Upon Trouser providing you with the information on the pagey within the very first room you're standing, you are shown a very long-winded cutscene of each of the platforms you will need to climb and exactly where the pagey is. Again, contrast to Banjo where you had the option of no guidance through the tutorial and no cutscene labeling the collectibles even though you very much could have. Why is there no option here? Also, just a side note, maybe Trouser would have been better suited at being at the opening of each level, or each world. It could be argued that he slithers in just as you open the book and sets up shop immediately with prices you won't be able to afford, giving you a lot of incentive to find more quills to get them juicy moves. Moves costing money was obviously an attempt to mediate the flow of new things that happen during the game and have something far more tangible in terms of an active object for you to value and exchange your hard-earned cash for. I liked it because it was well-priced, but if they all cost what required of you to collect about 95% of the quills, then I would say it would be too fucking much. Like a different game. Anyway, I see a lot of this as a stranglehold in terms of guidance. It doesn't stop there though. Trouser will lose his shit if you don't immediately head for the pagey. I, like many players, wanted to explore before grabbing the pages, but Trouser had other ideas and you'll find him badgering you to go up that series of platforms all the way to actually grabbing the pagey itself. Calm the fuck down. Like he will interrupt your jumping around to tell you to go to a particular direction. I know this is meant for kids and they're mostly retarded, but have some faith, right? Every time you try and pass the page in the opening of the hub world, it will demand that you free it, which is extremely annoying considering how much fun it would have been to figure it out, but every damn time, really? When you get the gem at the top of the ruined temple, the one you were personally employed by Shovel Knight to get, well, he makes sure that you know exactly who it's for and where to give it back just as soon as you get it, even though he is practically still visible from where you collected it. It's like, give me some breathing room game, come on. When you begin to break the rooftop covers for the aristocratic corplet, he lets you know that he appreciates it and that it isn't over yet. When completing the little section for him, he'll tell you now that you need to return to him, and he'll even give you a cutscene of where he is in case you have the memory of a fucking nappy. Some forms of guidance will repeat every time you restart a challenge. Overall for this opening though, the player should be more than equipped to deal with what will be coming next, and what is more so a relinquishment of control by the game to you, but with a caveat or two I guess. So if we move on to some more specific examples, we can get an idea of more of my criticisms of the guidance in the game. When you find Clara and protect her from a horde of enemies, she remains in the pot. And many players, including once again myself, feel like the quest wasn't over. You receive the pagey, but she just stays in the pot, assumedly cooking away until she makes a neat little soup. It is a little confusing. Planka tells you that your job is half done after getting a pagey from the minigame that concerns him at the top of the ruins. The only other character that tells you something similar to this from my memory is the slot machine bandito, which I'd already visited at this point. If you guys remember, it was in the first area I went to in Capital Casino. I spent a while looking for different ways I may have missed something in this segment. Remember the whole butt laser thing? Well, the whole half done thing doesn't mean the same thing here. It simply means that there's some useless papers in the sky. Do whatever you want. If you choose to grab all the pieces of paper like I was led to believe I needed to by Planker, he will also say something about doing the job next month. Which, when considering what Nimble says to you during the conversation far earlier in the game post-race, would imply that you need to turn back to Planker once you change the weather. But no, you're finished with him after grabbing the pagey. And only the pagey. You didn't even need to speak to him, let alone grab the papers. This is just a really poor bit of guidance. At the very least, it's inconsistent. During the time in the Isometric Palace, there's reason to believe there are useful clues in the signposts that can lead you to solving several of the level's problems if you catch the hidden meanings, like the one about the floors being weak. As you walk around the Isometric section, you can find a signpost about the painters that have done a plastering job in this area, but it doesn't lead to anything. Now, am I crazy or does this look like an outline? This honestly looks like it's got a rectangle of space cut out for it, but 
that, that, that's nothing. It's not even a secret. The signposts are sometimes helpful, but most of the time confusing and can actually be very misleading. The problem with not being intuitive is that you will naturally waste the player's time as they attempt to solve a puzzle that has been translated completely wrong to you or doesn't even exist. Is it always a developer's fault? I would say definitely no, but in the cases I've highlighted and the fact that we did not receive tutorials for the things, like the ever-perplexing butt laser, the ability to lick batteries and power lightning, or how about the fact that you aren't even taught how to use first-person targeting, I would say these lend more blame to the developers. I found the first-person targeting by accident and I had to tell two friends who were playing it at similar times about it when they were confused as to how landing certain target shots were almost impossible without it. All of this would be fine if it was more consistent compared to other sections. There is plenty to praise though, the game has a substantial amount of intuitive design. There's no denying that you will attempt to lick most if not everything, and as a result you will lick the battery and then perhaps test the electric pad, and it will work. You will assume that using a sound wave to awaken sleeping characters is more than reasonable as an expectation. How about finding characters that are uninterested to speak to you directly? Well, that means that the second I turn into something completely different, that I may want to give that conversation another go. I've never thought of any kind of objective issue with giving a tutorial to a player that can teach even the babiest of babies how to play a game. All it means is it's all-inclusive for the most part, and that's good. But if we go by that standard, then the game just fails us in the late game for that feature. But if we don't go by that as a judgement, then we face massive and unnecessary handholds at the beginning and middle. Overall, the tutorials and forms of guidance in the game are absolutely fine. They aren't too obstructive, I just find many of the decisions within the game very odd, and very few hot fixes here and there would solve most of it. I don't see many people complaining about it, so I guess it's really just fine. Regardless, that pretty much leaves us done and dusted with the whole mechanics section, which means we have something new and exciting next. Well, for those who are curious, this section is essentially going to cover how the world comes together, overall and in pieces. Rare, and by extension Platonic, were always so very fantastic at fostering worlds you feel the need to run around in and absorb. The colours, landscape, the music and the characters all created this sense of whimsy and fantasy on a different level than that of something like Skyrim or Witcher. A fantastical cartoon world, if you will. Now it is a commonly accepted theory at this point that Capital B and his evil group of controlling faggots on the TV represent Microsoft and their takeover. But that sort of gives the world a chance to have some cool ideas on that front. Like a mystical world where everything could be books while looking completely industrialized. Mixed with toxic sewage being disposed improperly by Capital B himself in order to maintain his book stealing machine. Like seriously, these worlds are so incredibly realized, they really pulled off a huge effort to change how each world felt to explore. They had separate yet imposing monuments, combining even the minigames, mechanics learned and soundtrack alterations. So let's talk criticisms. It is fucking stupid that butterflies don't mind being eaten in this fucking world. Nah, I'm just kidding. Let's look into some legit criticisms from the people of YouTube. Level 4, on the other hand, can drink piss out of my ass. It's this gigantic casino where you'll have to do all these dumb minigames for tokens that you'll trade in for pages. Jesus, okay, um... Did, did you have to sound all cool and gravelly when saying, drink piss out of my ass? Drink piss out of my ass. Yep, that's just embarrassing. And as for dumb minigames, well, citation needed since the only one you're referencing on screen turns up in Banjo-Kazooie. Albeit a harder version, but it is a memory game that requires you to match images. Not that dumb really, but yeah, what else you got? The fourth, a sprawling casino, is disappointingly lifeless considering the gaudy source material. This place is flat, dull, and filled with banal, chance-based tasks like slot machines that grind the pace of the adventure to a halt if you don't have awesome luck. Okay, enough with the term sprawling. It's another buzzword, but it's, it's more one used in a positive way. Everyone is using it without really any kind of qualification. To be a sprawling city or location, it needs to be about as controlled as a splat of paint on the ground. Things are leering off on their own. There's a distinct lack of direction and control, like a like a cancer. It's spreading all around. I could see the argument for levels 3 and 5, but 1, 2, and 4 all have like a square of land they're situated in. I mean, this is why I think they have interesting changes in designs, but fundamentally a casino is usually very handcrafted to put things in certain places that all ultimately occupy one giant square of space, which is what this does. Then again, this comment was from IGN, so I don't know what I should be expecting. Correct use of words? Nah. He also said what, that this casino is lifeless and the minigames are chance-based? Well, no they aren't, they're based on reaction time if you paid any attention to them, and secondly, no. The casino is brimming with artificial life, like that of a real casino. There are flashing lights and activities everywhere, and the land reflects that. 
Who's lost? Why is it so hard to fly around? Why does this casino level even exist? Why the fuck do you have influence? Approaching the casino level was interesting for me because I always see a level as a series of sections to approach and manage to hit that 100% mark. I get my bearings and then try and account for the world that way. This world felt like being in a large and active casino. There were things to do everywhere, distractions all over the place, and that's not even talking about how the collectibles always acted as something of a distraction. But I would find myself walking off to do a challenge nearby, whether or not I was currently searching for something else. Else, and then getting turned around, but that's the gameplay of an adventure. I worked to try and retrieve my bearings, did so, and continued. Capital Casino is a very well-realized world. It is filled with relevant mini-games, graphical assets, and characters reflecting the environment it is intending to foster. Loads of it relates to gambling, memory, slots, money-making, etc. This world receives the most criticism of them all, despite being the most thematically loyal. Perhaps that is part of the reputational downfall, but I think it may be more so to do with the reviewers reaching the end of their proverbial ropes near this world. Capital Casino is the first world I managed to 100%, aside from a single glitched set of tokens. The experience was fun, having to tackle each area and defeat its associated challenges with controls and camera that 98% of the time worked absolutely fine in levels that ran well in a world that suited itself in all aspects. And it's because Capital Casino is so oppressive in that there's non-stop influence on your senses. Again, much like a real casino, and very unique compared to the other levels. I don't know, I haven't really heard a good criticism of Capital Casino, and for the most part it works wonderfully well. So let's expand to all the worlds. There is a handful of criticism that the worlds have an emptiness to them, as we've said before. I have covered how there is a hell of a lot less junk in the world. Everything you find in this game has a strong use, though I don't know if they make this criticism before or after the expansion. Honestly, it doesn't matter since they're both wrong, but I would remind all of you that the maps in Ukulele are bloody large. They have double the minor collectibles and 2.5 times the major collectibles added on. Perhaps they should have added more, perhaps less, but I think it's ridiculous to be saying that there's not enough stuff in the game when there's hardly any section of ground that doesn't have something happening on it or near it. This is just a personal preference thing that you simply cannot please everybody, but it's such a sad reality that Platonic aren't given the appreciation they deserve for creating such wide worlds while filling them with plenty to do. Like whether or not it is enough for you, please try and mention the substantial increase of collectibles and size of worlds while also placing these things with actual purpose. It makes literally no sense not to mention it, but it does make your audience partially believe that the worlds are indeed the same size as the previous titles, and also have less in them, which will help your narrative once again, I suppose. If these two games came out in reverse, then I guarantee people would have been saying Banjo had tiny levels, trying to appear as though it had substantial content, or some shit like that. That's the thing, though. Banjo-Kazooie had the benefit of being released and remembered, as opposed to being hacked up and strewn all over the room to provide points to every single reviewer's different ideas. Also, I'm getting really tired of downright hyperbolic shit posts on their video reviews trying to point out how shitty the worlds are. And when it takes you 10 minutes to cross the level- well, Geez, it would be pretty unfortunate if I was able to just, you know, test this theory in real time, if I was able to, you know, jump in the game and record myself from going from the beginning of the map to one of the ends of the map. Like, like, if I could pull that off myself within, you know, X amount of time, anything under 10 minutes, then maybe it would actually, like, be worth it. 10 minutes! Hell, I could even remove the athlete tonic and use only what's available at base to make it from the beginning of the level all the way to the end once again. And you know what? I'll even, I'll do you a huge favor. I'll show you another thing that's possible in this game, and that is to take advantage of the butterflies that are around you. Utilizing the world like that will allow you to be able to pull off pretty much any kind of basic travel from A to B relatively easily. Oh, look at that. Ten minutes! Well, looks like you're kind of a piece of poopy dick. It gets annoying. Yep, these reviews really are. People in the worlds will always reference the others as a way of making it feel a little bit more interconnected, on a character base, as I had mentioned previously. The world is almost entirely approachable, you will find a way to climb most if not all things, however sometimes it feels a little glitchy. But you also have the innumerable amount of shortcuts going both ways from all over the hub world that give us a sense of that too. The world is unlocked by a combination of completing different challenges, making use of abilities, and of course having the needed amount of collectibles. On top of that, you can view parts of the environment from some angles and not others. This will all combine into that sense of cohesion that can be rare in this genre. There was a moment when I was recording my third playthrough where I got carried away and just started rolling around listening to the music and admiring the world that Platonic had created. It was actually pretty neat. You can find yourself doing this in any environment ever, but every element has come together here to really try and give that feeling regardless. <laughs> The 
but let me criticize at least something about it. There seems to be a handful of segments in the world that are just kind of a little bit empty, or sort of look like they were going to have something on them, but don't? You can complete a little platforming segment and literally get nothing. Was it just for the visual? It is unfortunate that the characters don't change dialogue on certain events, such as having a certain move when the character that provides you that move is actually assuming you don't have it yet, even though you can have it at that point and he doesn't really react to it. Honestly though, my personal criticism is having to return to levels no matter what. I am all for backtracking when you couldn't really figure out a challenge, but when you are literally told you need a particular move and you are well aware that you do not have it, it is frustrating because I know I will return to this particular piece of land in this level, open a door and get a pagey and then I'm done. And that's it, if I remember which area that exact thing is in. I could return to level 1 knowing full well that I have missed a pagey due to a locked wall but have completely forgotten where it is. A simple solution? Just trade a basic puzzle for the advanced one wherever the first world that would have had that move exists. Allow me to 100% as I go through, if I search enough. If the world was one giant landscape with several doors connecting it, a la Metroid and friends, then it wouldn't have been anywhere near as artificial. I understand that this is just something I feel and I don't really hold it against the game. Speaking of which, how do they connect things in this world? Why do they have these crappy black doors everywhere that disrupt the flow of the entire game? Do I go this way or do I go this way? This is where you're supposed to go. No, wait, this is wrong. Did they really need that for every single d Hmm. In Tribal Stack Tropics, you can approach three doors that are all blacked out that literally lead into each other. It's fucking weird. Mostly, though, they are ineffectual to the world. There are a set of doors that connect parts of the tower section on the other side of Tribal Stack Tropics. They aren't really doing anything aside from allowing players without Fly to get to the top of the tower with ease. Honestly, they aren't even something you notice when you're using Fly to wipe the place out for the 100% which you would have been doing to get the page at the top of the ruins anyway. In the ice world there is- <sighs> Okay, Dunkey, you cause you're the one that started this stupid criticism of the game, let's explore this in detail. First of all, we have the infallible game of Banjo-Kazooie presenting plenty of these black door connectors, not the least of which is littered in the entire ship in Rusty Bucket Bay, but present in many parts of many levels anyway. So I can only assume that the issue isn't that they exist, it's how they're used, or how often they're used, so let's go map by map. Tribal Stack Tropics is around about a giant wobbly circle in that you can traverse the entire thing as one of open area. There are very few doors, as we've covered in the selection leading to nothing, a very strong time-saving one, and one for the underground secluded piece of gameplay, and finally a handful on the tower. Now, nobody's going to complain about the ones that save a solid amount of time, or do nothing, so how about the tower? Well, like I said, you can traverse the tower without them, so, like, use at your own discretion? Finally, the one with the secluded minigame segment thing, well, for one, they are present in Banjo, and the reason I bring this up is... Banjo-Kazooie is one of my favorite games. Aside from that, though, I don't see it as being something that difficult to keep track of, nor something you have to do a lot to really just keep in consideration of maximizing your chances of 100%. So I think that this map is safe. Glitterglaze Glacier is home to what is essentially the most varied map in the game. It has a general blob with a tail for the main world that has one door that takes you quickly from one side to another. Three different doors that connect to the same alternative piece of land but in sections. The entrance to the isometric maze and finally some more standalone minigame sort of areas that connect. This is a little more complex I'll hand you. We are looking at a grand total of what is essentially a heckin lot of doors. But do you see how these things connect? Do you see how often you do not need to use them at all? I apologize if this sounds vain, but I understood this map pretty quickly. There's the main chunk of land, and then there's a little chunk of land that sort of acts as a nexus with some interactables inside. Then we got a selection of teleporters taking us to different mini-areas. I would say that Glitterglaze Glacier is the most disjointed of all the maps, but it doesn't make it make any less sense. This is something I consider par for the course in games like this. Ultimately, I guess I'm asking would you prefer everything laid out in one big square with connectors? Ultimately for me though, this is essentially a very similar design, if not less complicated, than Rusty Bucket Bay. Well, that leaves level 3, 4, and 5. Mooney Maze Marsh is a giant stretch of land that is much more akin to sprawling, by the way, but it is contained among a large square, with what are essentially a handful of islands, with some bigger than others, and some connected to others. The same can be said for World 5, and as for World 4, it's practically a straight square that contains several other squares of varying sizes, that don't connect in any significant teleporty way. It also has a room or two that shoot off specific sides. Worlds 1, 3, 4, and 5 are laid out in full, with full access at all times aside from bonus minigame areas. There is hardly a single black door that you would venture to more than once upon figuring out what it's for. So where is this criticism coming from? Well, I have now seen people not only parrot Donkey's points on Unity, but the puzzles and the world, but people have literally taken his clip about the doors and started playing it in their own videos as additional evidence of the doors overuse. Enough. What is the section Donkey's referencing? Supposed to go. No, wait, this is wrong. 
Did they really need that for every single day? Hmm, okay, so during your time in the Isometric Palace, you'll be moving between rooms and this is the kind of amount you'll be seeing the doors, passing through them and listening to the jingle. It isn't that much, certainly not as much as he made it out to be, but wait, there's more. There is a challenge in one of the many rooms of the palace in the world in the game. This challenge is similar to that of Legend of Zelda. There's a couple of games that do this, but the point is that you have three directions to take upon exiting a door, and then you have to find the correct sequence to get out. There are sometimes characters that can tell you what to do, or you can work with the process of elimination. Regardless, you'll be able to get through and continue adventuring, but when you cut up this area into segments alone, you can really make it look a lot different. Why do they have these crappy black doors everywhere that disrupt the flow of the entire game? Do I go this way or do I go this way? This is where you're supposed to go. No, wait, this is wrong. Did they really need that for every single door? Well, there it is. For anyone wondering what I really personally think about the black door thing, I didn't give a shit. And neither should anybody else. It occupies such a tiny and inoffensive part of the whole game in general, and has one sequence where it is focused. Fucking one. If anything, the presence of these acting like teleporters in Worlds 3 and 5 is simply evidence that the developers considered their worlds large enough to cancel out some travel time, but that's about it. And with that, I shall bid you adieu, my fellows. I shall be making my way now, but I will be back to talk about more stuff and junk um, next time. Thank you for watching, folks, and I will see you next time.